Does the phrase measure to improve ring a bell? Well, we also do this in the field. Today, specifically, we are going to talk about how to measure organic matter, the organic matter content in our soils. I'll tell you about it in this video. Before beginning to enhance a soil, to restore it, we must understand the condition of the soil. When we visit the doctor, one of the initial tasks they ask us to do is a blood test, isn't it, right? Well, it's the same with soil. In this case, we're going to talk about organic matter, a very important component for life, for the natural fertility of our soils. But how to measure the organic matter content in the soil? Well, there are actually three methods to do it. The initial one pertaining to site. The soil that appears darker in color indicates a higher presence of organic matter within it. It is about observing the soils and seeing what color they have, even comparing them to soils that have a lower organic matter content. The second one is a very simple system, extremely easy, that we can effortlessly make at home ourselves. And the third is to have an analysis done at a laboratory. This obviously has a cost, but it is the most accurate method. But let's begin with the second one, how we measure in a simple manner, using tools that we can possess at home, whether our soil contains a significant amount of organic matter or a small amount of organic matter. Let's see a very easy way to measure if we have a lot of organic matter or little organic matter in our soils. And we will accomplish this using an ingredient that I am certain all of you possess in your homes, hydrogen peroxide. Go to medicine cabinet, take hydrogen peroxide bottle, that's all. This method is simple. Starting from this location, we acquire a sample of soil, always ensuring to remove the topmost layer where a significant amount of organic matter is present due to the decomposition of leaves, although this layer can be deceptive, and subsequently, we pour hydrogen peroxide onto the soil sample as part of our procedure. And what we'll look for is to see if there's a reaction. If there's a reaction, bubbles will start to come out of this soil after pouring the water. This is the process of organic matter undergoing oxidation. If there is no reaction or bubbling, it indicates the absence of organic matter. The greater the reaction, the greater the amount of organic matter. In fact, in this area, we observe the reaction and the bubbles that emerge from here. This means that we have more organic matter, that we have quite a bit of organic matter in our soils. An excellent method to determine if this is reacting is by placing it in close proximity to the ear and listening for a substantial and consistent bubbling sound. If this bubbling lasts for a slightly longer duration, it also signifies that a certain proportion of this organic matter is being stabilized, as it has undergone a considerable transformation into humus. Humus is the most stable part of organic matter. Therefore, it's good that there is bubbling and it's good that this bubbling lasts over time. In the absence of bubbling, this soil would possess almost negligible amounts of organic matter. So with this simple method, using water and a bit of soil, we can conduct an initial test to determine the amount or magnitude of organic matter present in our soils. But this does not give us precise information, which is surely the most interesting. This serves to make an initial sampling to know where we stand. From here, the recommendation is always to take a soil sample and send it to the laboratory to provide us with a number. You have a soil organic matter content of 1.3%. This is valuable information that will enable us to begin preparing, programming, and planning regenerative strategies aimed at improving the organic matter content of our soils for long-term sustainability and productivity. Let's observe how we conduct this procedure in the lab. To analyze soils in a laboratory setting, we essentially require three essential tools. The first, the main one, something to finish. If we have an auger, it can work well for us. Although in soils where there are many stones or they are very dry, as is the case now, it is really more complicated, but this tool never fails. The second tool is a bag, if it is possible, preferably airtight, that is used to place the soil samples in for further analysis. And the third one is a permanent controller to point here. How do we do this? When we conduct soil analysis, what we cannot do is take just one point, especially if we want to look at organic matter, minerals, physical chemical analysis. Because if we take a single point, it might not be representative. 
we could be unlucky to sample soil from a spot where something happened, and the result wouldn't be representative of the entire area. The standard practice is to opt for either four, six, or eight specific points where we will extract a small amount of soil from each and combine it to create a highly important sample that is representative of the entire area. How many sampling points should I take per plot? How many analyses should I do for each plot? How many analyses should I do for my farm that is 10 hectares? It depends, actually it depends. What we need to separate is between homogeneous crop units. That is, if I have one type of soil here and a completely different soil 100 meters away, something that can happen within the same plot, and I take a bit of soil from here, a bit of soil from there, and mix it in the bag, I will have a sample of soil that does not represent my farm at all, because it will be two different soils mixed. Therefore, the result will not indicate anything to me at all. If I have two different soils, I have to do two different analyses. If I have 10 ha with only one type of soil, I can do one. If I have 10 ha with five different soils, I have to do five. This is very important. From here on, for each point, each analysis is where we will take four, five, six, eight different, but of the same type of soil to collect different samples. We're going to mix everything inside a backpack. Another question, where do I get the soil from? Which part of the field? The field is huge. I'll tell you where you shouldn't take the soil from. You do not have to remove the soil from a location where there is a problem, unless you want to examine the issue from a location where a different, even small, management of the path has been carried out. You don't have to take the soil from here. The soil should be taken from within the field and from areas where the soil is rather homogeneous, although it will never be always the same. All right, we are currently inside the field, but the field is extremely large. I have the option to collect soil from either the middle of the path or underneath the tree. It's an olive tree in this case, but it could be a vine or any type of crop, a cereal field. If it's a cereal field, if it's a vegetable garden, in the end, you have to take soil from different points in the field. But when working with woody crops, we have to choose carefully, because this aspect is also very important. Where are the roots of these plants basically working? Well, they are basically working near the planting line, more in this case because there is an irrigation system. And although some reach the middle of the street, I am not interested in taking soil from there because most of the roots are working here near the trees. What I desire to know is what is occurring in the vicinity of the trees because that is where the roots are functioning but without collecting samples directly beneath the planting line because it is a location with reduced sunlight where various phenomena occur. Thus, our approach involves establishing a point midway between the planting line and the center of the field and consistently adhering to the identical patterns. Normally, we typically move approximately 0.5 meters away from the planting line, but we are still located within the root zone. And from that position, we extract the soil sample to be sent for analysis. There are many parameters. Sometimes we can take the soil in one way or another. Sometimes one person takes it, sometimes another. Sometimes it has rained, sometimes not. It is not feasible to have an absolute value that we know is 100% accurate because a multitude of things are constantly transpiring and transpiring in the soils at all times. However, there is another suggestion I wanted to share with you, which is of great importance to me. If the individual responsible for gathering soil samples should be the identical individual collecting all samples from every soil, at the very least for one undertaking, because assigning someone else to do it may result in variations that could potentially distort the outcomes to a slight extent. Moreover, one of the interesting aspects of soil sampling is not just capturing the current picture, but understanding what is happening now. How much organic matter do I have now? 2.6, right? Otherwise, gain perspective over time. How much organic matter did I have five years ago? 0.6. How much organic matter will I have in two years? I do not know. I hope to ascend I hope to continue ascending to determine if we are ascending or descending in order to compare over time with this field at other points in time. 
In my opinion, the most crucial factor is to ensure that, if feasible, the identical individual with the same approach consistently collects these samples over time. This is done to minimize the risk of obtaining results that may not be entirely accurate within our respective fields of study. This is an extremely straightforward and uncomplicated approach to work. Soil analyses have different prices depending on the laboratory, but just by examining organic matter, the cost should not exceed $20, $30 at most, making it a very affordable option for us. If we examine more aspects, such as microbiology, then the prices are different, but merely considering organic matter is not costly. We do not perform it annually, as there is not a significant amount of activity in a year in relation to organic matter on a temporal scale. We will do it every year, but the results can even be strange. Our recommendation is to do it at least every two years, every two, three years, which is enough time for us to see that things are happening. If the outcome we perceive we are obtaining does not align because the level of organic matter is decreasing, we must reassess the strategies we are employing if we desire to improve the amount of organic matter in our system. Once we have established the point, we will then proceed to extract the soil. Our objective is to make an effort to reduce the height by approximately 20 to 30 centimeters, if it is achievable and within the realm of possibility for us to do so. It is a little dry at the moment, but we will be able to do so shortly. Here we observe roots of olive tree plants. This is always a positive indication. And now that we have practically descended by approximately one foot, what we need to do here is obtain a sample, not just from the surface, in reality, not from the surface. We extract it, this contains a significant amount of organic material. We are not particularly concerned with the microbiology aspect here, not solely from the top 20 centimeters, as it would not provide a representative sample, but the objective is to collect soil from the area between the surface, excluding these two centimeters of organic dry material from the bottom of the soil. So we would need to collect soil samples from the entire profile and then combine them together. To accomplish this, it is necessary to carefully scrape the walls of the hole throughout the entire profile, ensuring that the soil is released in a top-to-bottom manner. By doing so, we are able to obtain a soil sample that accurately represents the area, providing us with valuable data for analysis and further study. However, as I have mentioned, it is insufficient to merely consider one point. This particular point may vary from the rest. Our procedure involves selecting four, six, or eight representative points from the plot collecting soil samples from these points, placing the soil in a bag with a tight seal if possible, and then combining a small amount of soil from each selected point to create a more representative sample. This sample can even be mixed further at a later stage if necessary. Typically, the lab requests for 0.5 kilo of soil or slightly less, which will be more than sufficient. It is crucial to make sure that on the bag, you utilize a permanent marker to write our name, the name of the farm, the client's phone number, and the field name accurately and clearly. This is extremely crucial because if we fail to execute this correctly, the outcome becomes completely worthless to us. The laboratory receives this bag with half a kilo of soil with the names here, and after a few days, weeks, depending on the laboratory, they send us a report with the result where they put the name of the farm, or the client, and the name of the field. And we have the ability to position the newsletter exactly within the field where we took the sample, ensuring optimal placement and accuracy. Sometimes we make a field, a plot, sometimes we make many, so we have to be precise with the name. If instead of the name we want to put a number, let's show number one, we have to create a paper, a table, where we put sample number one corresponds to field X in this case, and from here we will receive accurate results, unlike the previous method. The lab will inform us that you have a 2.6% concentration of organic matter in this soil. And based on this information, we can proceed with the necessary measures to enhance its quality. And the most interesting thing is that every year, every two years, every three years, depending on the resources, on what is done, we can reanalyze, go through the same process, and measure 
if we are truly improving, increasing the organic matter in our soils or not. And if not, it means we need to change the strategy. If our goal was to increase the organic matter in our soils, the important thing here is to choose a good laboratory that measures organic matter. Almost all or all soil laboratories do this. And select the appropriate points to sample the soil in order to achieve our objective. Because what matters is to take a representative sample of our soils, of our fields, and send it via mail, via whatever means available, to the soil laboratory for analysis and evaluation of soil health and quality. He will be in receipt of this, will carry out the corresponding analysis, and will transmit to you a report in which he will inform you that in this specific area you have 1% organic matter, 2, 3, as is the situation with these soils, in this specific area. And this information is very valuable and is the starting point from which we have to begin a strategy to improve the amount of organic matter in our soils. To what extent? The truth is we don't know. A soil with 3% organic matter will perform better than a soil with 2% organic matter, or even better than a soil with 4% organic matter. Do we currently have soils with 4% organic matter? How far are we planning to go in terms of organic matter content? The truth is that as far as we can go. If we can have a 5% of organic matter, better than a 4%, but this will be seen. In summary, the first thing we need to do is to know the organic matter content of our soils to define regenerative strategies, usually to improve this content so that our soils function better. In a subsequent video, I will provide you with an in-depth explanation of what organic matter is and the various productive strategies that farmers have been employing until the present day to decrease the content of organic matter. Additionally, I will discuss the different regenerative strategies that farmers can utilize to effectively increase the carbon organic matter content in our soils.